Good morning. My name is Alastair McGibbon. Over the last several weeks, I've spoken with high profile Australian political, bureaucratic and business leaders as we explore Australia's cybersecurity landscape, including the recently released 2020 cybersecurity strategy. To conclude the series, we're joined by one of Australia's preeminent leaders whose career has spanned the public and private sector. Jane Holton's 33-year career in the public service includes the positions of Secretary of the Department of Finance, Secretary of the Department of Health and Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Jane has contributed extensively to community health through local and international bodies, including the World Health Organization and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Pre Preparedness Innovation and Innovations, amongst many others. She has extensive private sector experience, currently sitting uh, on the boards of ANZ Bank, Vault and Clayton Utes, uh, amongst others. Australia has turned to her expertise in health as we've navigated the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, where she sits on the National COVID Commission. For today's discussions, uh, her views are particularly relevant. She brings extensive experience in cybersecurity, finance, risk management, law and public policy. Uh, Jane Holton, good morning. Hello. That's a very long introduction, Jane, uh, but <laughs> you and I know each other well enough to know that we could have gone on for another five or so minutes. Um, Jane, my first question about the cybersecurity strategy comes from paragraph 36 of the strategy, my favourite one. Um, it actually talks about flagging more onerous duties uh, for directors, fiduciary duties. Mm. Um, you sit obviously on the board of large organisations. Is this a necessary thing to drive cybersecurity? Well, I certainly think so. I mean, I think all boards are very conscious of issues of risk, but not all boards have what would be probably considered to be the best practice was probably uh, about three people who actually have extensive experience in IT, security, particularly cyber issues. So I think reinforcing to uh, the boards of our publicly listed companies, but also our private companies, that things like cyber security are increasingly important in terms of their broad responsibilities to manage risk. And clearly that goes to their fiduciary responsibilities as well. So I was actually quite pleased to see that reference in the strategy. I think that if we can remind people that the world is moving on, it's becoming much more complicated and they need to basically stay in front of the game and not behind it. So you know enough directors and you sit on enough boards. How would you educate board members and frankly the C-suite of those organisations that aren't as developed as say a bank would be? Mm. I, you know, My dealings with them show that they're, they're obviously at that, that upper echelon. Mm. How would you educate um, others in industry about cybersecurity? Well, to start with, we need to make sure that people have access to good information. So I think it's incumbent on the senior management uh, in companies, but also on the director cohort itself to make it their business to find out what is going on in the cybersecurity world. They can't manage their business and they certainly can't understand and mitigate risk unless they understand this. It wasn't something we were worried about very much 20 years ago, but these days, if we're not worried about it, we are vulnerable and that means our businesses are vulnerable. So it means going and doing the AICD course, actually finding people who are competent and indeed expert to come and talk to the board, um, making it your business to go and visit companies who actually understand this business, go and look at good practice, and then push management to actually explain to you what it is that's going on inside that company and how it is that you can have confidence that they have got the most cutting edge approach to these risks, which are real and growing every day. We'll come back to what you think that risk environment is, if we could. Um, the, a week after the strategy, the 2020 strategy was, was uh, announced, the federal government put out a paper about critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. In that, it, it, there, there, there will be changes to the Securing of Critical Infrastructure Act. Um, a couple of questions that stem from that. The first is, are you comfortable with the thought of the Australian Signals Directorate or the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, the manifestation of cybersecurity for that organisation, mm. potentially actually having hands-on keyboards inside large organisations like a bank? to respond to an incident? Well, I mean, I think it depends on the capacity of the organisation. I think it depends on what service is being offered. 
by that particular um, part of the ASD world. And in some instances, people will have themselves very highly developed and really competent mm -hmm. infrastructure people approaches. Now, do they need that level of support from ASD? Well, probably not. Um, however, there are many companies who might say, I'd like some help here, please. So, I, I mean, I do think there's a boundary issue that we have to think about. Uh, we can't actually expect our government to come into every single enterprise around the country, and nor would we want them to, actually. But if you're at a particularly vulnerable point and someone is offering you assistance, well, I, I think you would probably be derelict if you didn't think about how you were going to get that assistance. You raised a couple of good points there. One, the scale question, the, the government's talking about expanding from five to 12, possibly 13, if you include government entities as critical infrastructure. Mm. So you, you, the eyes have to match the stomach uh, in terms of that capability. And, and but, but essentially it's looking at that supply chain risk issue, That's right. um, which strikes me as a sensible thing. Absolutely. Um, but then, as you say, I mean, Again, you know, my dealing with the banks over the years, they, they have really well developed and sophisticated cybersecurity entities. Yes. And I mean, and again, there's, I think, a very key focus on this. So I actually chair the, um, the ICT committee at the ANZ Bank. Um, we have staff who have themselves worked in cybersecurity inside government. And we have made it our business to make sure that we have the best team that we can find. And sometimes that also involves uh, bringing in expertise from offshore if we are um, trying to stay at the cutting edge. Now, as I've said already, this is a day by day proposition. So we need to make sure that uh, what was good yesterday is still good tomorrow. And that's the thing that I think most people don't really understand. This is not a, oh, I fixed that. Yeah. This is a constant exercise. It's not a mission accomplished. It is uh, not a moment. mission. No, we no. know how well that went anyway. Yeah, we do. But, <laughs> but Jane, I'm going to come back to the talent question literally after this. But I'm just going to say to, to people uh, online, if they want to send questions in uh, near the end of this interview, we'll, we'll get questions from you and we'll, we'll put them to, to Jane. Uh, Jane, let's talk about talent mm. and, and where we find it. Uh, you know, cybersecurity is a, is a human talent industry as much as it is about Absolutely. vendors and technology. Um, what do you reckon the state of our talent is in the nation and, and how can we improve and grow that workforce? Well, it depends on whether your perspective is glass half full or glass yeah, half glass empty. Half full guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm how are you? Yeah, I'm a pr pretty much the same. But I think the point we're making here is the glass isn't full. Yes. Uh, so I think, and I think if anyone's got a, a child who's considering what they might be going to go and do at university or in some sort of um, TAFE course, uh, I have pointed out to people that uh, if you want to give your child good advice about where to get a job going forward, I do think cybersecurity is one of the places yes. you could actually it's, direct them. It's white collar, it's clean. You're not likely to be unemployed and, soon. And, and it's, it's growing well and it's growing exponentially. So to, just and anyone thinking retraining, I'd be considering <laughs> that as well. But but I think it, this is actually a real challenge for us. Yeah. So uh, in an environment where we know that the threat uh, and this is from uh, state actors, it's from non state actors, it's from uh, people who actually are very sophisticated out there and who do not have her best intentions at the core of what they're doing. Their resources uh, grow and their sophistication grows day by day. So if we don't match that, if we don't have the resourcing domestically, including relevant um, international expertise as required, but if we don't build that expertise here in, a, in this country, we will be an easy target. And I think if you think about the old days, um, you spent time in the police force, uh, we used to say, well, uh, I'd rather burglar go next door than yeah. come to me. So this is exactly the same. If we don't stay um, on the cutting edge of the security that we have and that people know we have, and that requires talent, uh, we will be a very vulnerable target. So you, your large part of your career was in, in uh, the public sector as, as the introduction highlights. Mm. If, if you could have one policy, one program that helped enhance that cybersecurity skills pipeline, what would it be? Well, I, I think, I, I'm not so sure it's a policy, actually. I, I think it is actually bringing this to people's attention because you've already gone to the issue about what the directors know. And the answer is some of them know a lot, some of them know something, and some of them don't know anything. But similarly, I think, again, um, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, 
caused recession. Where unemployment is uh, high, it could have been higher, we would acknowledge, but particularly for young people who are disproportionately affected at a time like this, if you were thinking about, uh, as a government, how you might encourage those young people and show them where opportunities might lie. Well, clearly, one, giving them information about where the opportunities are is crucial. But then secondly, making sure that these kinds of courses that we were just talking about, that they're actually available to those young people. So for me, um, it's not necessarily, although I think we could have a conversation about what should be mandated, and what we should be saying to companies over time, they must do. And I think the cybersecurity strategy is giving people pretty clear signals about where they need to be, including issues in respect of sovereignty, but we can come back to that. I thought you Absolutely. might. Yep. Um, but certainly at the moment uh, for government, reinforcing to parents, um, to education institutions, and to all of the, th the drivers that actually will take people into a pipeline so they can develop this expertise, I think would be enormously helpful. So uh, I've got like 30 questions that come from this, but I'm just gonna do it, which is rare for me, I know. I'm just gonna go on a slight tangent. I wanna, because you talked about this concept of whether we tell people what they must do. You've got a really strong background in health policy and now working with, with you know, global uh, you know, health institutions. We've seen really I'm going to say increasingly catastrophic ransomware type attacks against yeah. hospitals. And one of the reasons yeah. for that, and, and we know this in the cybersecurity industry, is because the way you certify a health device, as you know, is it's, it, it's certified as a whole, which includes the computer operating Absolutely. system of what might be a really expensive MRI or That's some it. other machine. Exactly. So the certification itself actually leads to aging computers being attached. That's right. So... The certification is designed to make sure the medical device does what it's meant to do, but because of it, it's actually driving cybersecurity vulnerabilities. How do you unpick that? Because if the machine doesn't work at all, <clears throat> that's way worse for, for, for mm. a patient. Yes. So in fact, th this is the whole challenge, isn't it? That the regulatory regimes need to keep up and in fact not be behind, but in front of these kinds of issues. So you raise a really important question. Increasingly, we have embedded technology in life critical equipment. And so what we need to make sure is that the regulatory regime mandates the regular updating um, of all of all components of that equipment. And that includes the ICT elements that give them support. So if you think about it, and in fact, I was in a meeting yesterday where I was reporting to a board about an ICT review, including measures around patching, um, including issues around password security, including what had happened in terms of a recent exercise um, to, to mirror phishing, to see what the human element risks were in that, their particular environment. Well, what's crucial to that is being up to date. Yes. And so being up to date and making sure that the regulatory regimes, including things that authorise the use of equipment, be they medical or otherwise, because there's all sorts of critical... Um, in increasingly so. Increasingly right? so. Yeah. But making sure that what you have is the most current, the most secure approach to that technology is fundamental. So you're right. And I think one of the things that has to happen with regulators is they have to start thinking about how they factor into a regulatory regime. Not that I will approve every instant because that brings with it delay. The regulatory framework should include that your technology is up to date. So essentially I'm gonna say you're arguing for moving to a <coughs> principles based type environment where you say this type of device must be patchable, come Correct. with security turned on, etc. Correct. Now we've both sat in government and we've sat in some some several meetings, obviously. Do you think government falls into that category as well, where it's a compliance based type of security environment versus a sort of a principles risk based that you might see more often in in industry? Well, I, I think it's going to be horses for courses, isn't it? <laughs> so I think um, I'm a big fan of actually having a principles-based approach because a principles-based approach actually stays more current. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, as the environment in which you operate uh, changes, the expectation is that your regulatory compliance, the way you go about meeting those requirements, will stay up to date. 
as we know, you need to, however, monitor and manage compliance against those principles. And so to the extent that particularly operational people in an operational context, sometimes you have to give people very specific instructions. So what you would be looking to do, I think, in terms of best practice, is have your principles clearly established. But where you're in very specific operational environments, mandating for the people who are responsible for implementation, clear instructions is, I think, desirable. What we know, um, and, and let's think about um, people who are um, on the border of our country. Do you really want them to be exercising judgments about, based on principles about whether they're going to let somebody into the country or not? The answer is probably no. The principles will have actually been interpreted to say, if there is a, uh, a UN if red flag, this, then, yeah. uh, these, this person is not to be allowed into the country and et cetera. So I think there is a marriage between those two, which gives you both an assurance of flexibility and um, timeliness, but then the ability to translate that for the people lower down who actually need to make practical and, decisions. And they need rails and repeat. And they need rails. Yeah. So it's getting the settings right. Correct. Um, well, these are all questions without notice, but a question without notice. Um, who do you think does that best? If you think, if, so you sit on, you've sat on government committees, you still sit on some, uh, and, and obviously a lot of private sector uh, boards now. Who's getting those settings right? Um, I think it's very hard to nominate one sector over the other, to be honest. I think it's often organisation dependent and it depends on, we go back to where we started, the knowledge, interest and expertise of leadership. Now that's not a strength of our entire country in my view and I think the reason why um, the cybersecurity strategy is so important is it's starting to assert that as a country, be you in government, be you in the private sector, be you a member of a not-for-profit organisation, uh, everyone needs to be minded to these issues and to put in place strategies to deal with it. So, I mean, a lot of people would have heard of um, the agile approach mm -hmm. to organising their business. And what a lot of people have learned as they move to implement Agile, and they're moving away from letting the managers manage and having everything devolved, which brings with it quite significant risk. What we're trying to work out is what's tight and what's loose. And there are some things in terms of the way you manage, be it whichever sector, that you want managed quite tightly. And I think this is one of those categories. You do not want uh, someone lower and down in an organisation, be it government or private sector, to be making up for themselves what's an acceptable standard. So we're getting much better at articulating risk appetite, thinking about how that risk appetite should be translated into our businesses. And then we're getting much better at working out what should be core and ubiquitous in any agency and cybersecurity should be one of those things. Um, and you mentioned the word risk multiple times mm. because Cybersecurity is really cyber risk management. Absolutely. Uh, which also then moves to more of your principles based thing because yep. you're sort of evolving <clears throat> depending on a risk being realized. I'm going to pivot uh, and ask you about our national sort of um, emergency response capabilities. Mm. You've, again, given all the different places you, you've sat in government and now the private sector, um, should cyber be treated as just another critical threat vector or should it be its own category is it can, can we put it in with natural disasters and other coordination type efforts well i think it's increasingly becoming just that um, it, it is of sufficient magnitude and sufficient threat and that's what we see isn't it in those frameworks um, when something is a relatively modest risk it may be grouped with others and treated in that way as things emerge and we can see this now with some of the issues we're experiencing with climate, um, that we're having to disentangle those, and be very clear about how we're trying to manage and mitigate those risks. Cyber is exactly the same. I mean, when none of us had personal computers, and even if the we did- The good old days, frankly. The good old days. Respects, I'm going to um, say, but do, anyway. do, do we all remember having to dial up and hearing that weird tone as our computer connected to the internet via the telephone line? Um, in those days, the, the notion of cyber risk was was really pretty minimal and 
um, you know, those early uh, pieces of malware were quite a curiosity. And in fact, I think we all know the history that some of those were created, including um, uh, by, you know, students in the Philippines who were trying to get access uh, uh, to uh, free uh, internet access. But as the world has gone on, um, what you would have done to manage in that environment, which may well have been nested with a whole series of equivalent risks, is completely different today, yeah. where you can take out, you've mentioned critical infrastructure, you can take out the operation of the electricity grid. Um, that means no homes with power. A and that therefore warrants singular and very focused attention, including in an emergency context. Um, is our political system in Australia the right one to handle that type of thing? Or how, how do you fit that process into a, into a federal environment? Well, I mean, let's make a distinction between the structure of the constitution and the political and system. And the way it's, okay, and yeah, the way yeah. it's driven. So, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, fundamentally, there are all manners of governments all over the world. Um, it's the responsibility of elected governments to basically make sure that they have good governance over the things that matter to the good uh, functioning of our society. That means, and we've seen this, um, the ability for, uh, in our case, a federal system, for federal and state governments to cooperate on matters that actually are national within the bounds of their respective constitutional responsibilities. So I think, to be perfectly frank with you, um, the structure of our governments is immaterial. What we want is for every party to this discussion, be they local, state, federal, uh, to actually come together to actually deliver the right kind of protection that we need as a country. Because our economy, the welfare of our citizens and our residents depends on it. So do you think that the really catastrophic fire season we had um, this time last year, right? I mean, this time last year, there were huge parts of the country burning and it only got worse. Do you think that actually helped prepare us for COVID-19, actually that federal state coordination? Mm. Well, of course, there's a Royal Commission running about this at the moment, and I, I spoke with them fairly recently. Uh, what, what we've got is a set of emergency management arrangements that were, I think we would describe in technical terms as well exercised through that well, period. Which in a weird way, if you're a glass half full people, then, then weirdly the, the really crappy events of this time last year. So does COVID-19 help re-bring some of that federal state? I mean, I, I don't want to get political. I watch papers try to find division um, or the media try to find division. Do you think generally the COVID-19 pandemic, if we're looking for upsides, because there's a hell of a lot of downsides, um, could that help drive that better cooperation that will help us with cyber matters as well? So one of the things we know in an emergency management context is that what works well is clear lines of accountability, but also great levels of interchange and cooperation between competent authorities doing their jobs. So if you look, we're sitting here in Sydney um, at New South Wales, um, the State uh, Coordination Centre that goes under the lovely acronym of the SHEOC, um, which given Fantastic. the premiers, given yep. the premiers, a woman I particularly enjoy. Yep. Um, so the had been heox all along. Now there's a sheok. There's a sheok, um, but the good thing about that is it's very clear who's in charge. It's also very clear who brings competence and, and um, uh, basically capacity to the table, and then people can go out and deliver what is needed in the particular context, be it fire, flood. Um, delivery of hotel quarantine, all the sorts of things that they're responsible for. And so that kind of more sophisticated approach to managing complex systems, but doing it in a way where there's clear authority, management oversight and risk uh, management and knowledge of risk, I think actually has been a real hallmark of what we've seen in the last probably, would you say, 12 months. And you're quite right. Um, there's no doubt that these very mature arrangements, which were well practiced due to bushfires, what we're now seeing in the pandemic context is actually that now coming into its own. And I've had the uh, privilege of been talking to people around the country on some of these issues recently. And there is no doubt in my mind, these are very well-oiled machines. Now, 
how do we maintain this kind of posture in the medium and longer term? That's one of the things, for example, the Royal Commission into uh, the bushfire recovery is looking at at the moment. And I, I get the impression that they're going to make a number of recommendations in respect to structures that will actually facilitate, for example, recovery. But it is the case that um, in a weird kind of way, the bushfires did prepare as well for the circumstances we're in now. And one of the changes that we've seen when we talk about that political system is the, is the, the, the invention or the creation of a COVID commission that you sit on, mm. which now uniquely places business leaders mm. sitting with key parts of the bureaucracy and the political class, right, mm. cabinet, to help make decisions to, to bring Australia out of this. What role, without, you know, that's a fascinating couple of hours in itself, um, but what role can cybersecurity industry development in Australia play in bringing us out of this, of this really bad state we find ourselves in economically? Well, I mean, if we look at the economy, uh, clearly we've had a huge shock. Um, we've already talked about the terrible uh, consequences for younger people and for older people, many of whom have basically, and I was talking to somebody yesterday who hasn't been out for months and months and months um, because rightly they are concerned given their age and their health status um, that were they to catch uh, COVID-19, they would potentially have a very bad outcome. But what we have to think of, and if I draw the parallel with the economy, um, what we don't want is a really bad outcome uh, in terms of our economy as a consequence of this pandemic. And so one of the things that people are very actively talking about is what does the economy look like going forward? What have we learnt about our strengths and our weaknesses? Where do we think the opportunities will be in the medium and longer term? And one of the reasons I raised this question about um, thinking for, for parents about opportunities for their kids in things like cybersecurity is there's no doubt um, we not only have strengths actually in this area, but we also have a need. So this question of where our economy sits, what are the industries for the future? How do we position ourselves for a world that um, has gone unbelievably digital in the last six to eight months? Um, as I, I laughed, uh, as I was sitting on a call for a board I sit on the United States, clearly we're not going there at the moment. And the chairman of that board, who is the president of the University of Florida, said in a slightly um, tired tone, so how are all my Zoombies today? Yep. Which is a statement of the pandemic, isn't it? Regardless of whether you use Zoom or some other uh, piece of technology, we've all gotten very used to standing, sitting, but staring um, at a small screen as the way of conducting our business. And so the kind of change we've seen in how we do what we do over the last period, I mean, I would argue has basically truncated reforms that might have taken us, you know, four, five, six yep. years. Now, as an economy, we need to recognise that. We need to leverage on our skills and capacities. We also need to think about the importance of sovereignty and supply chains right. as part of this. Well, I'm Funny glad I you say raised that, that because my next that. set of questions, Jane, mm. evolved. So you sit on the board of a sovereign cybersecurity company, yeah. Vault, yeah. Um, and and you've been the Secretary of Department of Finance, where where I had the pleasure of dealing with you from time to time, and I would ask for more money and you wouldn't give it, but I still like you. Um, <laughs> and uh, you didn't deserve it. But I, I, I appreciate that. Cybersecurity seems important now. But um, question for you, government procurement. Yes. Right? I mean, so how many companies have we dealt with that say, I find it easier to sell offshore than to the Australian government. Mm -hmm. Now, 2016, Malcolm Turnbull launches the first funded cybersecurity strategy. It was as, as much about opportunity as it was about threat. Yes. You know, he talked about growing that industry. And, and I reckon it's, you know, and, and I, obviously I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not objective about this, but subjectively I'd say I think that industry has turned um, and we're both involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, government procurement. How can government procurement rules change without us getting into trade issues? How do we preference industries without crossing that line of trade wars? How do we develop sovereignty? Long question. You feel free to take even longer answering. How, how, do, you, how do we undo that knot? Because 
Government, federal government spends, what is it, eight to $10 billion a year on ICT. Yep. The states and territories would add up to billions upon billions yep. of dollars. Where do we go there? Long question. Okay, well, you can have a longer yeah, answer. Long you, question. You're, you're, you're so, 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 so let's, let's start with a fundamental uh, problem that we have. And that is, um, it is easy for people to procure what they know. Yep. And it is easy for people often to procure from multinationals. And as we have seen in this pandemic, uh, the trouble with long supply chains is that uh, when push comes to shove, we are a long way away and we have to have, if we're going to look after ourselves and our fellow citizens, some local capacity and I'd give the example here, and it's such a, a little issue. We couldn't get enough masks for our healthcare professionals at the beginning of this pandemic. And we had to rapidly repurpose uh, manufacturing capacity to produce masks, to give uh, our frontline health workers dealing with people who were suffering in intensive care from COVID-19 to make sure they had the right protective equipment. And so we became aware that that was a very real supply chain constraint. We nearly ran out of Panadol, which might sound at one level um, bizarre, but we did. We didn't because of some fantastic effort on the part of uh, uh, negotiators around the world. But the reality is we started to understand our supply chains. And the global well. supply chain vulnerabilities, efficiency Absolutely. versus Absolutely. built in redundancy. Well, well, and let's be clear that basically because of a just in time uh, approach to managing supply chain, you don't necessarily have the and have enough of whatever it is you're looking for in a time of crisis. And as I have said now publicly on many occasions, every time I did an exercise about pandemic, I have to I have to acknowledge not once did we think about toilet paper. Yeah, well, but toilet yeah. paper is the perfect metaphor <laughs> for this. So when it comes to um, domestic capacity and these really constrained supply chains, what we have to think about here is what do we happen? What will we do and what will happen and what do we do about it? in the event uh, that we have a supply chain constraint on our ICT infrastructure and including in cyber security. And that is not to say that I um, do not believe in competition, I do, but I also believe that we need to have enough of a viable domestic industry that gives us the capacity to metaphorically, if we need it, retool and resupply just as we did with masks. So let me ask this, and, and I proudly don't know a lot about government procurement despite having government roles. Um, you on the other hand know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues that a public servant faces is this concept of value for money. Mm -hmm. And I, I always used to think, well, when I go to a supermarket, I don't always buy the cheapest product. Sometimes I'll buy the most expensive product, which to me is better value for money. You like better quality toilet paper, I just and, tell. And it, well, I do. I make the admission I have a lot of it at home, if anyone's interested. <laughs> Seems to You're the, the problem. Price gone, the now, price now has we gone know. down. Now we I've know. always been a bit of a prepper, um, <laughs> just don't tell the internet. Um, so uh, we should be safe. But, but you know, so value for money and all that type of stuff. So And, and it often struck me <clears throat> that public servants would just buy cheap. cheap because their view is they're spending, and it all comes from the right yeah, yeah. heart. It's the right place in the heart, yes. but it was about, I'll go cheaper because. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so again, this is where people, um, and including the people making decisions, uh, have a misapprehension about what the procurement rule, rules require. Firstly, they talk about value for money. You've already made the point that value can be defined in a series of ways, and it is certainly not just about price. So price is not the only determinant of value. And of course, you can consider that value may also include a variety of um, other factors, which might go to surety of supply. It might go to other benefits. You've raised the issue of the free trade agreement, and we do have to be mindful of that. You can't preference suppliers under the free trade agreement, although there is a big carve out, which I just remind people in respect of defence and security related issues. Mm -hmm. um, which you'd argue cyber security is uh, fundamental I, these I days. I would fundamentally both. argue yep. exactly the same, to be frank. Mm 
Um, so there is a carve out in the federal procurement rules in relation to that. But yes, the, the challenge I think is for governments and others to ensure that the people exercising those procurement decisions, um, they need to have a constant reminder, I think, that value is not just about that cheap product or toilet paper, but it is actually value conceived of in that broader sense. Okay. Um, so would you make any changes to the procurement? Uh, my last question, would you, would you make any changes to those procurement rules or would you just help educate them on what it means? Well, there are certainly jurisdictions who are already thinking about yeah, changing. Bet, yeah. So the New South Wales government is actually currently running a task force to look at issues of uh, sovereignty and capability and how that might be influenced in the context of how they procure. And I strongly encourage that. I think it's important to consider this from a very um, single-minded perspective, which is are the procurement rules as implemented doing uh, what we need them to do have we got value properly defined? And then this question of how are those rules implemented uh, is something that needs to follow. So, I, I mean, I guess what I would argue is in terms of federal procurement rules, probably another look should be had to actually require decision makers to think really explicitly about what value considerations they're making as part of a decision. Because I think at the moment, these things are very much conflated at which means ultimately the person reverts to price. Whereas if in fact you were clear about what constitutes value as part of a decision-making process, I think at least it enables people to actually bring forward those arguments about what are the other benefits. Um, thank you. I mean, and, and I'd love to talk more about that with you offline. Can I, um, you mentioned how we fare versus other countries. I'm going to pick two of them, mm. Israel and the US. Mm -hmm. Love both places, actually, genuinely, but they're known for cybersecurity. Mm. Do we punch to our weight versus those two countries? And if no. not, why not? No. Well, why not? Um, uh, well, let, let's be clear. The Israeli government, um, and, and you could argue that this is for reasons to do with existential threat. Which I don't want the same existential threat. That no, no, thought, I right? don't want it either. Yeah. Um, but th what does it remind us? That you have to have a single-minded focus on your security. And from that uh, flow, a series of postures, decisions, um, and ultimately the development of the kind of industry we've seen in Israel, uh, which basically serves them well. And I'm the first to acknowledge that on occasion in places that I currently work, we have brought in companies with that kind of experience to give us advice because we're looking for the best advice. Yep. And certainly in the US, I mean, obviously the market driven economy, and we all know uh, many of these initiatives that we see come out of the defense related industry in the United States. Um, so they have, a, 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 I guess, a steel or a march on many of the rest of us in terms of access to cutting edge technology. Um, do you see us being able to lift ourselves into that category of nation or are we always going to be second tier? Well, I think if you think about it, the way to do that is firstly decide it's an objective. Yeah. And if it is an objective, uh, then think about what strategies we need to follow to actually get ourselves to that position. I personally would be very supportive of that as a national objective, because I think anything we can do that mostly both built industry, domestic industry, we're a long way away, uh, local capacity I'm a big supporter of, um, but also gives us an opportunity potentially to export to the world. Well, why wouldn't we? Yep. Um, we, we're not gonna have a lot of time for questions. I might throw to a couple in a second, but I'm just gonna ask you just one last one from my still very long list, it's, it's been fascinating. Um, you sit on the board of a, of a large uh, law firm. Are you a, are you a lawyer? Nope. Okay, good. I'm gonna ask you a question about law then. Um, <laughs> uh, so to me, as we create this cybersecurity sort of posture for Australia, the law actually plays a significant role, both in terms of you know, obviously yes. the regulatory bit coming from the top, but there's also increased litigation yes. coming from the bottom. Do you see that as an important part of, of that market signal to, again, to boards, public and, and private? Well, 
I mean, it is certainly the case that if you're not operating to or above the industry standard, you actually run the risk of being subject to legal challenge, including for compensation and damages, in the event that something happens uh, which should have been predictable and should have been able to be prevented. Yeah, and, and I should say that I'm a big supporter of that, so long as it's not done against me. Um, I think it's an important, <laughs> which is the caveat for all these things, by the way, whether it's regulation or other things. But yeah, so it's, it's, to me, that's it's actually healthy to see. I actually, I, in the last couple of years, I've just seen this shift in that ecosystem mm. that I think will drive better things. We'll just throw it some questions and I've promised to get you out of here in four minutes time. So we're going to be we'll do speed dating with questions. Speed dating with um, questions. How is Australia addressing the shortfall in non-technical, so, so non-technical cybersecurity skills? That's an interesting question. Um, well, I, I think I'd probably say not terribly well just at the moment. Um, it, I mean, basically, we've had a history of importing these skills. Yep. Um, and now we can't do that. It's quite difficult to get into the country at the moment. And in truth, if we're trying to uh, employ those skills and they're offshore, we've all got the, the same vulnerabilities that we have with the whole notion of cybersecurity. So um, we are, and there are significant numbers of people actually I'm aware of who are currently retraining. And we go back to that question that we talked about earlier. How do we give people incentive to join this industry? How do we give um, uh, companies incentives or encouragement or a stick if necessary to think this is something that they should be paying attention to. So let's create an ecosystem where there's demand for talent and the education and training system can deliver that talent, including through retraining people. Yep. And it's important that there are soft skills in cybersecurity as well. Um, people who can explain it to the, other the people. Translators, right? The translators. The yep. translators are fundamental. Yep. Uh, um, do you, so the next question, do you think uh, the Australian government, well, no, yeah, there you go. Do you think the Australian government gives enough attention to cybersecurity as a geostrategic risk? 1.35 billion over 10 years is a very small proportion of the defence spent. I'm going to say it's also much bigger than was done before. Yes. Is that enough? Well, I mean, is, is it ever enough? The answer is always no. Um, is it a very, very good start? I would, I, and you've yeah. made the point, uh, 2016, the level of spend was minute compared to this. I do think it's also important to understand that in addition to a separate budget line, which we're seeing here, we've also got now embedded in a lot of what's going on in departments, and particularly in defence as well, I might add, um, people are actually building cybersecurity into what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So in truth, if you would go through and say, it what is the total out. spend yep. on cyber security, it will be much, much, much bigger than that and growing by the day. And that is a good thing. Yep, great. We're gonna have one more question. Uh, the strategy proposes further regulation for board directors, consumers and critical infrastructure providers. Can't the market solve the cyber risk problem? Well, I mean, this is always the, the, the challenge, isn't it? Um, we probably need a combination of the carrot and the stick. Um, I do think it's sensible to be very clear about what um, what normative ex expectations are. Um, we, the truth of the matter is, uh, directors these days are very conscious of where industry standards are. And as we know, for example, in banking, we have the bear regime. Well, let's not kid ourselves. The bear regime actually does include these issues around cyber. So it's already there in many instances. Um, it may end up being spelt out more. And yes, I mean, the market is going to respond. You don't want to be, we don't want to be sued. You do want to make sure that you protect your business. You do want to make sure you protect your um, customers. And as governments and as people who work in this community, we want to make sure we protect our citizens. Yep, because this is now uh, an existential um, risk to us, right? As you, Correct. As you mentioned. So Jane, um, I promised you that we'd end on time. It's now, <laughs> according to my computer here, 11 o'clock, which is when I said we would end. I can't think of a better person to have actually wrapped up this series. So thank you very much personally for, for doing this. I, I know you have an extraordinarily busy schedule, including helping rebuild the economy um, after the, the biggest um, hit we've had in 100 years. So I should let you get back to doing that. I'll say to the uh, broader internet audience that uh, that's the end of our uh, four-part cybersecurity uh, strategy insights for 2020. Uh, it's likely that we'll morph this into sort of regular discussions about cybersecurity uh, as we come across them uh, in CyberCX. But Jane, thank you very much once again for today. That's my pleasure.